Good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure to share a very special guest with you tonight. Today, she is a messenger and ambassador for AGF and their book, Contemporary Jewelry in Perspective. Monica Gaspar has been the co-author and thinking partner of AGF in a multiple year long project of discussing and reviewing thoughts and themes within the contemporary jewelry field. AGF, a nonprofit organization which supports and promotes contemporary jewelry nationally and internationally, is the initiator of this book, Signing Tour, and has, has made it possible for us to verbally agree and disagree with Monica for a few days. In a public critique and reading groups, students from the ceramic and the metals department are introduced to what I would call the dancing mind of a curious person. Clearly a European voice, this recovering art historian, writer, educator, think tank partner, critical theorist and curator, loves to think and question every notion that has been become pleased with itself in the field of design and art and craft. Monica brings together work not bound by disciplines or defined by boxed expectations, but rather the work that is united by thought or better introduced to each other for the visible longing of the object to encounter and engage in new relationships with this so-called mundane thing. Monica has given the viewers of her curated exhibitions the possibility for new encounters, reorienting preconceived beliefs, and a chance to fall in love anew with what once thought was old news. So thank you to AGF, the Critical Study Program of Cranbrook, and first of all, Monica, for making this possible. And please join us for a book signing after the lecture upstairs in the lobby of the museum. And now help me to give a warm welcome to Monica Gaspar. So thank you very much, Iris, for this introduction. I'm now the standard now is put very high. I hope to do my best tonight. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you to my sponsors, AGF, for making this evening possible with you and for the warm hospitality of Cranbrook. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I was looking at the program and I gave a title originally to my talk and suddenly it was transforming into a, an evening with Monica Gaspar. So I thought, like, okay, if it's an evening with me, then it's also an evening <laughs> with you. So I changed the title and so like this is uh, maybe a kind of more suitable context of hopefully also a bit of exchange. Um, I will still tell you about what I planned originally in the original title, which was Objectography, um, Tales and Backups of Everyday Life. So I will tell you about these objects that maybe can tell stories and somehow become a kind of hard drive of our experiences. But I will also introduce you a bit to my practice and how, how I have dealt with these years as a, as a professional and how somehow introduce you how kind of a making of, of several projects I have made in the past. Mm, I made out, we, we had a, a, crit, uh, a, a reading uh, group this morning and we were talking about when, when words are not somehow satisfactory anymore and how do, can you cope with expressing and and fixing uh, thoughts when maybe words are not the right ones anymore. And it was the thing with you, Sarah. And it was like, okay, then next make up new words. For if the vocabulary, you have to, to stretch it a bit. So I, I made out this uh, objectography uh, word as a new term for, for today, for this evening. And it's a way to, to refer the practice of writing about objects, but it's also the practice of mapping through curating and researching, and also to, to somehow capture what is happening around objects and because of objects. And if possible, still kind of have a, a glimpse on this kind of encounters and disencounters between people and things in this everyday life. And also as a tool, so kind of more like academical tools, taking the resources or the complicity of aesthetics, of art and design history, and of material culture and critical theory, which is kind of very exciting field as well, 
to somehow make sense of these kind of practices that move between arts and craft and design. Since it's an evening with, with us, and somehow I thought, okay, I never um, have this situation of being addressed as an individual. Normally it's like, please give a talk on whatever, contemporary jewelry, or give a talk about uh, the influence of Rancière in whatever contemporary practice. I will tell you a bit about my bio biographical background. So maybe you can also understand um, the context of how did I end up making what I am doing. This is the image of the library of my grandparents <laughs> in Barcelona. I, that's the, my home city, I, I grew up there. And this is my daughter some years ago playing on the carpet and looking up to this kind of multi layered cluster of things that they are still in this house. I took this picture to capture the exact perspective I, I had myself when I was a, a child. So this kind of really lower ground level, up to half a meter, more or less, that was my, my territory. And it was also the, the possible playground where I was allowed to operate. So carpet and not more up than maybe 70 centimeters. My grandparents' house and my parents' house, they were connected through a garden. So that was a kind of an unusual thing in Barcelona. There was an old existing house, a garden, and then a new construction in the garden. Like if it would be the gardener house, that was my parents' house. I was always moving from one house to the other. So the garden was kind of one room more, in a way. And I was trying to get, of course, the best of both worlds. My, my parents' house was projected by my father in the 70s in a quite kind of modernistic and minimalistic way. So everything was beige and white and black, and the surfaces were sleek, and most of the furniture was inbuilt on the walls like sofas and sideboards with hard edges. I don't have pictures today, but I don't want to get too biographical. My grandparents' house was, on the contrary, built at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And in comparison for, uh, for me, it was between a kind of leisure park and a Libava cave. There were cozy sofas, there were carpet everywhere, there was wallpaper, there were curtains. These curtains were even changed by season, so they were responding to kind of dress. So the house was dressing uh, in different ways, depending if it was winter or summer. That was a big work of my grandmother. There was a TV, not to be dismissed. We didn't have a TV. And above all, this kind of overwhelming presence of objects. My grandparents had also an art gallery in Barcelona which was leading the avant-garde scene in Spain between the 50s and the 80s, next to Miró and Tapias and Clavé and the European abstraction and informalism. They were also the galleries in Spain for Picasso. So they even become close friends. I have pictures uh, of me kind of being with, the, with, uh, with uh, Jacqueline, the last uh, wife of uh, Picasso, and having this kind of really strange closeness to this kind of big figure of, of the art. In my grandparents' house, there was the, uh, all these kind of people going in and out, and they were, as they were also responsible, together with Sabartes, the, the private secretary of Picasso, to, um, to push the creation of the Picasso Museum in Barcelona. I like the metaphor that uh, Louis Johnson in, uh, in Anders' catalog in the Serenan house, he talks about a house when it becomes the house of paradox. And I, I, I read this text some, some days ago, and I thought that that was a very good uh, term to describe a place that it's kind of moving between this pub, uh, public and, and private use. And somehow I could say that this grandfather's house in Barcelona was also kind of a house of paradox, where important developments in the cultural, social, and artistic life of Barcelona were somehow plotted there. But back to the picture, what my daughter is looking is actually this. So she's looking at these kind of balloon lamps up into the ceiling, which has used to fascinate me as well. Oh, thank you. Like kind of planets or balloons <laughs> up there. But most of all, there was all this kind of family of objects up there, all this stuff, little sculptures, folk ceramics, uh, knickknacks, camouflaged kind of souvenirs from, from trips with a dubious taste as well. 
little um, objects maybe made by members of the family. All this stuff that somehow also intrigued me when I was a child. And all this kind of army of things, this armada of things looking down to us. There was no single free space in this house. There was no empty kind of possible space to do something else. Everything was really full. Here a collection of posters, some strange paper birds hanging from, from the ceiling, kind of Chinese kite, uh, some books maybe about to fall down. It was a really dense semiotic landscape. My grandmother was a kind of excellent social networker. She was cooking for everybody, but above all, she was an archivist for the good and for the worse. So she had a really compulsive drive to organize everything. She also, also had a tendency of being very economic. So she was using these packagings of his uh, hand, uh, husband's underwear or um, um, kind of uh, shirts uh, thing for winter. She would use these packaging bags to protect the most kind of heterogeneous things like original drawings by some artists or a full art or a menu of a restaurant, whatever. So these bags, they were everywhere. As an art history student in Barcelona in the early 90s, I soon got involved with this massive universe. And somehow I, I started participating in this kind of um, archivist drive that was kind of raising the family. And made, I started to make the register, not only of the art collection, but I also started to register the books, the teapots, the posters, the photo albums, the guest books with dedications from the most kind of amazing people having visited and eaten in this house, etc. This is my father somehow helping me to, to measure something, putting up on a chair. Things can become very demanding, I noticed very soon. So, this idea, and especially the ones that are providing us uh, aesthetic pleasure, these are really the most demanding ones, probably. And one has to care about them, and one has to preserve them, and one has kind of a responsibility with them. And for me, it became increasingly an issue. Which kind of dependencies people develop towards things, how things portray people, and how ultimately things become people. This is an old picture of the region of Appenzell. This is in Switzerland. This is the country where I moved to live around seven years ago. I left uh, Barcelona for Zurich. And the image I, I took secretly from a kind of local museum that was not allowed to take pictures, but I, I could not resist. And this image shows the moment when uh, servants and maybe probably a full village uh, was engaged in moving the belongings of a rich woman who had married to her new home. So this furniture seems to have legs, so it's kind of animated objects, so personifications of people transformed in things. I, I, I saw kind of, kind of cartoon-like qualities in this uh, picture. And they seem to be kind of funny characters, and I thought that this is a typical metaphor of the idea of treating objects as mini-subjects which is a kind of a burning issue of uh, theories about identity um, nowadays. Uh, the, criti the art critic Hal Foster talk about this kind of mini-me society, that every single object can be a projection of yourself. No? Your iPhone is your mini-me. It's even this uh, um, funny, what was this, uh, parody of uh, James Bond, uh, this really funny guy. Well, the, the, the Dr. No had the mini-me. I, I know you all know what I'm meaning. Um, even the philosopher Felix uh, Guattari in an interview about uh, animism in contemporary Western societies made the comment that we are not alone anymore. And I said, what does he mean that we are not alone anymore? Uh, kind of connected with this idea that if things can be, uh, be seen as actants, as Asians, as uh, Bruno Latour, the sociologist in this actor network theory suggests, this means that things stop being just only something, but may become uh, someone. Um, that was a funny thing yesterday, very briefly. The first uh, student in the, in the ceramic crate, uh, when he introduced himself, he also pointed at his work and he said, this is also me. 
So we, we are doing this all the time. So we are transferring our identity all the time from inanimated uh, things to our own kind of uh, human <laughs> body. We do this when we go to a, a place, to a restaurant, we put our jackets on the chair to reserve our place. And as, as long as we don't come back to this table, this jacket is you. So you are kind of delegating this object to represent you as long as you are not there. So it's kind of a magic trick. We're transforming ourselves several times per day. And this, in anthropology, it has a name. It's like uh, objects of reservation. How do you kind of delegate something else to be you for a while until you are there physically and actually? This intense kind of engagement with materiality in our everyday life and this, this idea of negotiating constantly which role objects play in this kind of sense making of the world is um, an important kind of human drive. So it's about world making and, and making sense all the time. It becomes crucial to be somehow in control over the material world. And if we can identify ourselves through objects and objects make who we are, then all this activity of arranging and ordering and displaying and moving things around in our private interiors, in our desktops, um, it's, it's a way of kind of finding reassuring moments of stating our identity. Um, there is a, a way to explain this kind of phenomena, and it's a, a something that uh, Judy Atfield, a, a design a theorist, has been uh, calling a containment, the notion of containment. And it's, she describes it as an important activity, and it's something that basically is about... Um, yeah, when someone arranges his uh, shampoo things and cosmetic stuff on the on the shelf in the bathroom, this is kind of a material portrait. Or when uh, yeah, you have a, a meeting maybe, and just before uh, other members of this meeting are coming, you are constantly kind of arranging your papers and putting everything somehow in place, just to have a sense of control. So it's a very it can be very kind of microscopic moment or with your own appearance and with your own body when you're about to leave the house because you are going out and you're still in the mirror, you check in the last second if the hair is okay or the jacket. So it's a kind of millimetric moments of control of materiality. And this Judy Atfield describes as a kind of moment of containment and moment of really making sense of being in control. Um, what I would I like also like to call in like moments of preparation in a way, kind of small choreographies, really kind of almost unnoticeable choreographies between people and objects that happen in these kind of moments of in between, these kind of slots of time where something you are waiting or you are preparing yourself. And of course, jewelry as a wearable object is constantly involved in these kind of moments of reassurement and of waiting, like turning a ring or maybe touching an earring when thinking or whatever, or pulling, uh, pu uh, putting the, the watch in the right position because whatever, you're nervous or you need some concentration. So this idea of smallness, I think it's also involved in this idea of um, reassurement and, and control. Uh, things, and especially wearable things, seems to give us confidence and seems to allow us to be in this kind of control of a situation. And it's also the first way, the most immediate way to interfere in this kind of most immediate territory of, of, uh, of, act, of action or of activity. This act of, of caring and of paying attention, of arranging and rearranging, it's um, something that is very much present in the curatorial practice, in a way. I, I like to see the curatorial practice as the kind of gestures of making sense with a particular um, space and with the complicity of different uh, artists and different works of them of um, coming into play. And it seems that somehow if you start to pay attention to, to things in such a way, uh, at some point things start to talk back. So what do you do? Okay, you pay attention, but what happens when things start to talk back? And I don't, I'm not getting here kind of a, um, esoteric or so, so don't misunderstand me. I don't hear voices, okay? 
What do I mean with this thing of things are talking back? I elaborate this now. I don't know what you see here, but for me this, this was a huge prehistorical bone in the beach in, in Llansa, somewhere in La Costa Brava in, in Spain. And it was even asking for a picture, so I had to, I had to take a picture. Or it was just a tree trunk, just washed by the sea. Okay, so it's, it's not important, but for me the important uh, element in this kind of activity of reading a situation or reading an image is this um, activation of the metaphoric and associative uh, thinking. And these are kind of strategies also of sense making, this idea of meta meta metamorphosis and, and transformation of something that is a given, but nobody says that it's the final um, way to, to perceive it. So for me, this is a kind of a, it has become a kind of a, a, a cultural technique or a strategy to, to look at this kind of moment of misunderstanding or moment of understanding differently. Maybe it's better put in this way. And somehow it's also a way to describe all these practices that are in my everyday that is about writing or researching or curating, which also become aesthetic practices in themselves, especially when using this kind of approach. The same happened here a bit. Just I, I have a huge uh, kind of uh, image file of this kind of misunderstandings. This is a, a, a train in, in, in the Netherlands kind of a trip back to Amsterdam, I can't remember anymore when it was exactly, but I could not stop seeing in this kind of coat hangers, uh, this kind of uh, a goat, goat's hoof, so goat's feet, and I really could not stop, and we were laughing because they, we were thinking, is it intentional? Did they really get it, these industrial designers? And it was something that was, when, a, when, a, when an image attacks you and you cannot stop seeing in a different way, I really have learned to appreciate this kind of moment of transformation or of interference. And I start to actively kind of uh, cultivating this, this um, uh, technique. And I have turned it in a kind of a yeah, strategy in a way. It's also maybe because I live within three different cultures and in my everyday I move constantly across five languages and the concept of is misunderstanding and or understanding differently, it becomes really an issue to be uh, explored further. So I started to look which artists and designers were using this misunderstanding kind of technique as a creative tool to move in between territories and creating kind of third space uh, levels of uh, aesthetic experience. And I also wanted to somehow encourage the, the readers and the, of my texts and the visitors of my exhibitions to also activate this kind of metaphorical and associative thinking when approaching the, the displayed work that was on on question or on discussion. So curating this uh, exhibition, Meta Domestic, in 2011, has been maybe the most recent chance to test this uh, thesis. This exhibition was possible thanks to the uh, support and the encouragement of the think tank uh, group. It's a European initiative for the applied arts that doesn't exist anymore, but was active during 10 years. And out of the discussions within this group, at some point we had the chance to make an exhibition at the Landes Gallery in Linz. It's a contemporary art space in, in Austria. And even more lucky, I, I got the chance to have a totally carte blanche to, to create this exhibition single-handed. So the beginning was a discussion, but then somewhat they were not so much interested and I was totally excited with the possibility to do something. And they gave me the um, kind of freedom to, to initiate a discussion with the art director and create an exhibition by myself with this um, topic of the applied today, the applied art today. Mm, the way I somehow I, I, I focus it, it would be that the exhibition would explore work inspired in the everyday, where the categories of artistic production and functional aim would blur in itself and somehow it would be a chance to redefine this kind of dusty notion of the applied as a social and cordial activity beyond the restricted set of traditional categories like metal or textile or glass, etc. 
in order to create a kind of an ideal context for this um, discussion, where in the exhibition I, I could display uh, visual art examples, critical design uh, practice, studio craft, uh, exponent, experimental film. Um, together, I, I needed something to create a guiding thread, and I used a literary source that could act somehow as, as a bridge for the public to somehow be confronted with these objects. I thought that everybody has read once a novel in their life or some poetry or some stories, but not everybody is familiar with conceptual practices in the crafts. So that was for me the kind of the possible link to, to establish and see what would happen if you are confronted with a text, a fictional text in exhibition, and then you are related, related or confronted with these objects. The text I selected was a, a short text by Georges Perec, that's a French uh, writer from the 70s, belonging to kind of an experimental literature group at the time. And it's a famous text that is about questioning the everyday and inviting the reader to reimagine the commonplace and somehow come back to the taken for granted and kind of sabotage everything to have a, a clear, fresh, innocent view on what is always happening there. Mm, there were different works, and some of the works I, I chose because kind of being more clear, representative. There were some pieces by Anders. It's an old piece, but the exhibition was so long ago planned. And this was, the, for me, the ideal example of this kind of aesthetic subversive practice, this kind of um, creating this misunderstanding between technological device and, and sculpture and, and placing the, these pieces also in an unusual way where the visitor maybe would not expect immediately to find an art piece. That was kind of, this is not the picture of the original setting in the exhibition, that's another, it's a studio picture, but that was the kind of the situation that we looked at the museum as well. We placed Anders' piece next uh, to a kind of alarm devices. Or there were some objects by um, David Clark, a, a British uh, metal smith, who also was using kind of this strategy of the misunderstanding. So he is uh, using kind of classic silver work that he even buys in eBay, like things that actually nobody wants anymore. And he somehow makes the interference within uh, the aesthetic of the Photoshop and the distorting of images and kind of translate it into uh, the traditional techniques of the metal smith. or Gemma Drapé's objects, a jewelry artist based in Barcelona, who actually developed this work as a degree show in Cranbrook. She was an ex-student here in this house, and she did a series of objects called Apertura, and she was also kind of playing with this idea of misunderstanding. They were kind of ambiguous, not really kind of uh, clear functional objects that were occupying your hand in a very particular way. So when you would hold this object in your hand, you would be surprised to find yourself maybe reproducing a movement that you know very well, like when you are texting a message, but with the surprise that the object that is allowing you to make this movement, you have never seen, and it's a really strange thing that it's somehow parasiting a familiar gesture with a shape that you would not know how to classify. So that was a very interesting study about kind of user experience, body, body gesture, and a kind of a form that you don't know how to classify, but at the same time it feels so familiar and so kind of comfortable in the hand. Different aspects of this idea of misunderstanding or using this kind of third space uh, um, areas of um, communication and, and, and experience was the, um, the case of this um, uh, kind of micro-architecture, they would like to call it, by Studio McKing and Bay. They are two uh, Dutch designer and an uh, architect working together in Rotterdam. And it's also this idea of uh, creating short-circuiting short or misunderstanding different codes of value and preciousness, using kind of antique furniture uh, in hybrid form with transport crates, no? so really creating an interference of, of value. And at the same time, as a result, offering a piece of furniture that is not only furniture, it could be like a little shelter or a little cabin that you could inhabit, kind of crossing also over different disciplines. This object could not travel to 
uh, MIMA, the Institute of Modern Art in Middlesbrough, that was the venue that hosted this exhibition in one year later in Britain. And we got a different object because this uh, kind of microarchitecture had to be in another exhibition in another city. So we got another version of this uh, work. And this work didn't fit anymore on the plinth. So we were kind of confronted with a technical problem, but at the same time with a conceptual one. So we had a really interesting discussion with the curator of this museum about how somehow sometimes objects kind of talk back, back and tell you how do they want to be displayed. And because of this kind of accident and this kind of unexpected um, change of plans, we really had a reflection about if the floor could also be the historical plinth for furniture. So why should we challenge the floor? And I think that it's uh, something to have now a short, um, how to say, a souvenir or a memory for Anthony Caro, who just died, I think, last week, because he took sculptures out of the plinth. So that's uh, something that has also been occupying myself for a while. How do you display and curate the applied? And how do you deal with this kind of um, plinth uh, question? This is, a, by the way, it's the view one in, in the MIMA Museum. And somehow, at, to sum up a bit the, the idea of this exhibition, it, it was a, an it, at, attempt to address this idea of persistence of things and try to bring in the territory of conceptual pra craft practices and critical design and visual art together. And most of all, kind of trying to address beyond categories and beyond hierarchies of the arts to address these aspects of negotiation between people and things and how meaning is somehow successfully crea uh, created or not. And this kind of back and forth is very much the territory of also the use and the user in itself. Maybe I would like now to move to a bit to back to jewelry because an object placed on the body is uh, an easy target for misunderstandings. It's as we said before, it's the territory of containment. So it's the first territory that you kind of attack or manipulate when you want to be somehow in control. So jewelry, when worn, is really at the front row for this kind of micro corrections. This was also a piece uh, belonging to Metal Domestic by Pia Aleborg, a Swedish uh, jewelry artist, and uh, we showed the brooch in itself, but also the photography of it as a kind of suggestion of the, the, the bigger question of this artist that was about taste and about gender issues and connecting her work in a context that she desired to, to connect to, to the brooch and not display it alone. I like to see when pieces are worn because jewelry, is, art jewelry sometimes has this kind of love-hate relationship with the human body and of course it's also like a paradox so in a way the body is the worst place where you can make a static uh, statement because it's a surface that is moving all the time <laughs> it has a kind of uneven surface it's uh, yeah it's even dangerous so you can break without wanting you can damage these objects um, if you're not careful enough you cannot control the light so it's the temperature, so it's a kind of a really tricky space to make a static uh, statement. So I, I'm kind of fascinated with this dichotomy, how art jewelry deals with this uh, um, unpredictable kind of target and this kind of unpredictable destination of, of their creations, even though it doesn't meet, need to be exactly the end station of the objects. So as someone dealing with jewelry also in the last fif 15 years, maybe already, as a writer, as a curator, as a lecturer, I, I still kind of, kind of intrigued and fascinated by kind of analyzing this, this space between the artistic intention, the artistic statement, and the user and the um, viewer uh, position, what they have to say as well and what they have to offer. So I'm, at the moment, I'm, can, I'm currently interested in, interested in the full kind of art and science of wearing. It's a kind of my new kind of 
question here beyond ornament, beyond the full discussion about beauty that has been taken in the past years and it has been kind of very monopolized in um, uh, jewelry writings. And I want to move slowly f towards this idea of, uh, okay, let's really take seriously this knowledge embedded in wearing and what does actually wearing means. And again, exhibitions are always a good medium to, to create discussion and to test ideas. And this, this kind of ongoing thoughts about wearing, it comes like a long time ago, actually. And I wanted to, to show you now some ideas that were developed about around this idea of, of wearing and of carrying something um, meaningful with you back to an exhibition in 2005 that I created in the Design Museum in Lisbon. That was uh, an exhibition called Norman Room Contemporary Jewelry, Intimate Space and Public Domain. The conceptual starting point of this exhibition was to consider jewelry as a placeholder and as a carrier of individual identity. Very clean and dry, that was kind of the starting point. And the idea would be to establish a correspondence between jewelry and the idea of the home, like a portable home. So if uh, objects can carry identity and they are kind of um, uh, mobile or, or movable, then let's play around this idea that the jewelry is a kind of a placeholder of the kind of the home territory and see what happens when transferring these thoughts in maybe in uh, exhibition context. Using this kind of domestic metaphor, I was interested in how design and gender studies and material studies were filtering this discussion in the arts and that somehow this perspective was uh, hardly present in the writings about uh, art jewelry. It was not an issue at all. But at the same time, jewelry artists were dealing with these issues constantly. So the practice was much advanced than the writing and the theorizing about it. So I, I wanted to somehow fill this gap and, and see what, what was really going on there. So I start to kind of observe or, or identify these kind of practices that were going on in jewelry that were kind of crossing over, like Marana as a jewelry maker, making this um, huge project, Meanings and Attachments, where she was interviewing and, and photographing people around the world and asking about what are they wearing and what these things that they wear uh, mean to them. So she was a kind of a mix between a jeweler and a sociologist. Or Martin Ruiz de Azua, who is a Spanish uh, product designer, he was producing a temporary shelter that somehow can fit in your trouser pocket, this, uh, that was called a casa basica, no? the, the basic home but had so much kind of jewelry qualities. So it was like, again, a kind of a, someone mixing anarchically categories, architecture, product, jewelry, uh, everything together somehow. Or practices like uh, the one from Filipina, the hand that is a jewelry, a Dutch jewelry artist, um, I think that was based in the States. And she also kind of made really interesting unseen uh, steps at the time of leaving the materiality of the object and making as a project a virtual home on the internet, uh, kind of an imaginary hotel where she would host uh, objects and people on their way home. That was the title, the really poetic title of her, her project called uh, Room 2000 and, no, 275. That was the project at that time. The only condition that I got from this uh, um, museum that actually was a center of culture, so cultural center, there was a kind of a collective of design museum and art museum and there was a theater and an, an uh, auditorium as well. The condition was that the show, this nomad room exhibition should somehow relate to the collection of contemporary arts that they also had in the house. So I had to somehow establish a link with what was there and this idea of creating an exhibition in the occasion of the uh, jewelry symposium. It was uh, the same year of the Ars Ornata Europeana in Lisbon. So that was also the reason why we, I had the chance to curate something at this place. So that was the, con the only condition. So I think, okay, what can I, what can I choose? <laughs> and I took as a um, kind of a, connect, a, a link to the, to the art collection a documentation they had uh, from a performance by Vito Aconci, 
uh, and this um, performance was called um, public domain. So it was somehow perfect for the topic about jewelry. And that was a piece from uh, 1972. And it took place in a, in a gallery in Rome. The gallery was called Latico. Attico is the penthouse. So even the name of the gallery was kind of referring to a domestic uh, environment. And um, the performance consisted that Vito Acconci was living in the gallery for, I don't know, three weeks or one month probably. And uh, all together, I can't remember so well anymore. And he was constantly exposed, so it had a miserable life during these months. So he was sleeping in the gallery, eating, so everything, cleaning himself, and he would have no privacy at all. So I thought that was an interesting work to link with the ambivalent nature of jewelry, which is an object actually always existing in this interface between the public and the private spheres of everyday life. So that the link was established somehow, so the, the condition of the art, the director was kind of satisfied or fulfilled, and that was my turn to now articulate the exhibition around these uh, requ uh, requisites. So I was looking for uh, pioneers of conceptualism in art jewelry. Of the same time, uh, hopefully, and, and trying to really find uh, older pieces in order to create this dialogue around the topic of the show. And the idea would be that it would be, the exhibition would be transdisciplinary, but also transgenerational. So I, I was sometimes uh, blamed that I was just focusing in the younger generation. And in this case, I, I didn't want to make a statement about youth or new work. It was about a kind of historical review and also this kind of thematic guiding thread. So I was lucky to have this box of materials by Orno Buchhardt, so one of the pioneers of art jewelry, which was um, deposited in, uh, in the archive in, um, in the Netherlands, in um, Appeldoorn. And that would be a kind of one of the reference pieces to articulate the, the show. Then I would have this piece from Bernard Schovinger, which is also kind of 75, 77, which is a bracelet made out of a, a lead and kind of a sardine can opener. So also kind of an iconic piece from this time and uh, good to have this kind of discussion about value between trash and treasure, what you want to take with you and what you want to uh, don't get rid of it. And then from 76, I would uh, uh, get this uh, piece uh, from uh, Heisbacher. It's a beep, so it's a, again this kind of paradox of a piece that is kind of sh sheltering you, hiding your torso, but at the, sa at the same time is exposing it. So it was a kind of a paradox piece that I also thought it was interesting as also a metaphor of the home. No? It's the, the home is the place where you somehow retreat from the world, but it's also a place where you can also display your taste and make your identity statements. I show you some pieces of the exhibition. Oh, we have to hurry up, I think. It's 10 minutes left, okay. So that was the Dini Vessens, a bracelet about here. So this idea that piece of jewelry also gives you a sense of this idea of presence, of the here and now. Um, much more literal um, interpretation of the topic of the show, so a, a, a house, a, a house to wear by Manfred Dischoff or the documentation of a performance by Marilia Maria Mira, who was kind of uh, cutting the dresses of different volunteers and just leaving the seams. And these seams were creating kind of very fragile, precarious kind of architectures or drawings on almost naked bodies. And here kind of maybe more also a kind of li a literal way to deal with the domestic is when you can just wear elements from it, no? as a reminder or as a souvenir. These are pieces by Marc Monceau where he um, took like uh, curtain rings and toys and kind of elements maybe of kitchen utensils and made them wearable. But this is really long time ago, but it was a kind of beginning of this idea of exploring a bit further this idea of wearing as a cultural technique and, and beyond objects and also kind of giving the, the territory of art jewelry a, a kind of a chance to expand maybe in a direction that is not just the aesthetic or the technical excellence. In the meantime, there was the curation of the uh, Schmuck exhibition in 2000 and, 
and 10 in Munich, but that was really half as exciting and curating the Nomad Room, and also the Meta Domestic show. So I'm quite of a slow cultural producer, so I don't have a blog, I don't have a website, so I just travel when it's really worth like being tonight here with, with you. And for a long time, I, I have been also longing for kind of more critical discussion around art jewelry beyond this uh, uh, kind of restrictions I just mentioned, not just a pure aesthetic uh, estate, uh, statement and this uh, kind of instimation with, uh, with the technical excellence. And this was the time when uh, Damien Skinner, art historian and the former editor of Art Jewelry Forum uh, website, invited me to take part in the book uh, they wanted to edit and the book that um, today it's already published and finally published. This was in summer 2010, the first exchange that we had. And now the book is there, Contemporary Jewelry in Perspective published by Lark Books some months ago, and here in perspective. <laughs> so the way Damien wanted to, to, to address this book or to, to deal with this idea of writing another book in contemporary children, you know, so we have, okay, we, I don't know if we can say we have, on one hand I think always that we have too many publications and on the other hand it's like, like we have so much missing of, of stuff, of really engaged writing. But in the last years, the, some of the books that have been appearing on, on art jewelry, they are again following this kind of historical perspective, you know, again following this really just descriptive, affirmative way of, of presenting facts. And the way Damien wanted to approach this uh, kind of departure with this book was very different, and that's why he really hooked me in the first uh, email because it was really exciting what he was uh, proposing. Um, he said he wanted to create a discussion uh, on one of the pa uh, of one part of the book. The book has three parts, and one of the parts should be a kind of a imaginary round table uh, amongst five experts. And these uh, guests were Namita Vigers, director of the Museum of Contemporary Ar uh, Craft in Portland. This uh, Australian writer and craft expert, Kevin Murray, Benjamin Lingel, who is a jewelry designer, but also writer and currently the new editor of the AGF, Damien and myself. So that was the kind of constellation. And the best thing is what, that there was no clear briefing, but just a kind of a generous invitation to have this arena of, of thoughts and, and, and try to make something together, which is really unusual. So people writing on jewelry, they write alone, and they don't kind of have a max exchange with colleagues, they have a commission, you do something, and that's it, and it's in the world, but a kind of a critical exercise of collectic writing is really rare in the field of um, writers in, in jewelry. So the result of this kind of first part was an intense exchange based on one first and only working session where we actually physically met in the same room that was in Seattle in 2010. But the rest was everything, Skype meetings and three continents in three different times, hundreds of email correspondences, and the result is what you find in this part one of the book. The idea at the end of this uh, exchange was to uh, identify which were the arenas or were the spaces where jewelry takes place. That was somehow the, the final structure for this part one. And which spaces does jewelry cross in order to define itself? That was an unusual approach, we thought. It was something worth testing and, and exploring. And as I said, we were kind of tired of this kind of pure historical accounts of, of uh, jewelry artists and jewelry movements. So we were looking for this kind of missing context and the result is this structure that you will see in, in part one if you flip through the book where we identified uh, seven different spaces where actually jewelry takes place. And this is the page, the page of books, internet pages, PowerPoint presentations, the bench where it's made, the plinth where it's exhibited, the drawer where it's collected and stored or just hidden away, the street, the body, and the world. So the first part was struggled with following this 
kind of seven different spaces and we wrote uh, really collectively. That was a very uh, uh, demanding exercise as well. It's very difficult. It's like if you make a piece uh, between two people or three people, it's a really kind of strange thing to, to share this kind of initial moment of, of creative drive. How, how do you share this? And how do you write in stereo? That was quite of a challenge. So every part of this, uh, every space, is, it has this kind of visual essay in, in, in between kind of references. So what is a page? The page of a book, the page of a flyer, the page of a um, YouTube uh, presentation. In Venge, we, we try to address this kind of uh, multi-layered and complex uh, space of work. You know? So what is a Venge nowadays? Maybe a Venge looks like this chaotic um, microcosm of Lisa Walker, but maybe a Venge also looks like a very clean computer desk. Or maybe the bench, it has become a full room. So we tried also to address this um, uh, complexity and which kind of pieces are produced in this kind of really influential and privileged spaces of, of creativity. And the plinth, so what is a plinth? How do you display jewelry? What is the kind of um, the language and the values that are embedded in this gesture of putting something forward to enhancing it or, or differentiating it from a context. And looking for examples not only of uh, reflecting on the topic itself, but also looking for examples where artists themselves, they are kind of uh, dealing with these spaces as a theme for their work. The drawer, different kind of drawers. The drawer is also, of course, the commercial uh, space. No, it's also the place where you can somehow dig in and, and, and lose yourself and, and have this feeling of um, hunting mode you know, and looking. And that's also the place where the pieces may even end up in a collector's house. But the workshop also has drawers. And what, what do artists have in their own drawers? So that was a bit also of a sociological exercise. The street, what happens with art jewelry on the street? Does it have the same? Uh, way of functioning than commercial jewelry, or how does it operate, and different examples of artists engaging also with the public space as a material or as a medium to talk about jewelry or, or express work that has to do with jewelry. The body, of course, works for the body but also about the body. And this was a kind of an abstract. Uh, choice like jewelry in the world in this kind of maybe more um, wider picture aspect if they are kind of issues that can be addressed that go beyond the practice of itself you know, so ethical issues issues about sustainability issues about social justice and how our jewelry is somehow engaging with this bigger picture so that was a quick uh, browsing through the book and that was it for tonight. Thank you very much.